Welcome to Cloud and Clear, the podcast by SADA for innovative business leaders and technology enthusiasts, where we explore how Google Cloud is transforming the industry and what that means to you. Now, here's your host, Tony Safoyan. Super excited to have Rajan Sheth here with us today, Vice President of Product Management, Google Cloud, Artificial Intelligence at Google. Welcome, Rajan. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for doing this. You and I go way back, many, many years. One of the reasons I wanted to speak with you is because I think the work that you were doing when we first met has been so impactful to our business as we know it today. And you were then, probably this still exists with regards to your reputation, but you were known as the, the godfather of Google Apps, the creator of G Suite, um, and, and and I think I want to hear more about that because I knew nothing sure. more than just your reputation. But uh, <laughs> that's really kind of when we started working together, and you were engaged with strategy and partnerships and customer engagements. Uh, but even before that, I think you have a really interesting history in your career trajectory. So uh, I'd love to learn more about that, and of course, then we can talk about what you're doing today. Definitely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, happy to talk about it. Um, and so, so to give you a little bit of background about where, where that all came about. Um, so I've been at Google 15 years now. I started in the enterprise group uh, here at Google uh, in 2004. And the enterprise group is what is now Google Cloud. Um, but it, back then, it was much, much, much smaller. It was about 25 people, I think, when I uh, when I joined. We had about 10 engineers, we had a few salespeople, a few support people, and then uh, a few of us, uh, Dave Gerard in particular, who had started that group um, back then and was building it up at that time. Um, we had one product, which was the Google Search Appliance. And uh, then we've, the, the mission at that time was to figure out, you know, how can we build out something bigger around enterprise uh, with Google? And we knew it had a lot of potential, but we didn't know what uh, exactly at that point. And we also didn't know how do we turn Google into a company that can work with uh, work with enterprises. And so the first thing that uh, that I came in the door to, uh, to to pitch was Google Apps, which was essentially Gmail at that time uh, for for enterprises. Um, and actually, what prompted me to come to Google um, was I was actually VMware before that, and right. I'd gotten the invite to use Gmail uh, when Gmail first came out in two thousand four. And I noticed when I was using it that. One, it was phenomenal, but two, it was better than what I was using for email uh, in work at that time. And right. so I thought this could be a great enterprise uh, product. Um, so did when I came to... Your, did your one year at Hotmail influence this? Definitely, definitely. Because, you know, the uh, I was I was at Hotmail for about a year and um, we had similar thoughts back then because the whole web-based model was really um, something that we thought could be very powerful. And then I was at a company called Zaplet uh, before that, um, uh, actually after Microsoft, before VMware, where essentially we tried to do that. We tried to create web-based email systems and email, email-based email collaboration. And unfortunately, it was too early that uh, the web was not mature enough and what you could do through a browser was not mature enough uh, at that time. And so when I saw Gmail, all of a sudden you could build, at the time it was Ajax-based interfaces that were really, really fast, that felt like uh, thick client applications, but that you could update and you could access from anywhere. And so it was, it was a revolution at the time. Um, and so that definitely influenced uh, my, my view there. And uh, what was interesting is, so four weeks into my time here at Google, Dave, uh, uh, Dave Gerard, um, had a meeting or put, put up, put a meeting in, uh, in place with Eric, Larry, and Sergey to pitch a bunch of ideas um, for enterprise businesses. And so I put together the pitch for what became Google Apps and got to slide one and it was immediately rejected. Um, Oh, really? (laughs) Yes. And so, and and the point was actually valid at the time because what we were proposing was packing Google uh, Gmail into an appliance and sending out uh, to to companies that way, similar to what we were doing with search. And Eric's point at the time is, you know, there's not a lot that's distinguishing us there. So find out something that's really distinguishing us and then come back with it. So about eight months later, I came back and 
pitched the idea of actually a hosted version of that where we would host everything in our data centers. We'd focus it on small businesses and uh, education to begin with, but then grow into uh, into large enterprise. So we got approved at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, we got approved for one engineer and was told, go build part of it, show a proof point, and then then we can extend it further. So the product, we, the product itself in, in Gmail existed. So this one engineer's job generally was to make it possible for people to run it on their own domain with That's all the correct. controls in place. Like that was the, that was the initial charge. That was the initial thing. And so figure out how you can make it run on your own domain. Plus then what we were doing is influencing the Gmail team on, on features that we would need to make this actually ready for enterprise. And so that model of kind of building our own stuff, but then influencing these other teams really is what, what has propagated um, uh, through to today. And, um, and it ended up being really successful. So our first customer was San Jose City College, um, uh, which you know local college, but it it exercised a lot of what we needed. How do you get eleven thousand students on their own domain with administrators tied into their backend systems, all of that stuff? Um, and we also released a small business product that then created our enterprise product, which became Google Apps uh, Premier Edition, which is what we released in two thousand seven. Um, and we built our enterprise business uh, based uh, based upon that. And so then that that's kind of what grew. Um, and at some point, there was a press article that 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 coined that term of father of Google Apps, and that that has kind of stuck ever since then. Well, I think the the strategy, our work as well initially was yes, we had some small businesses, but the most challenging type of projects that were transformational were the education projects because yeah. of the number of users they were going away from i mean what i had was unix pine you know email so it was, it was so much better than what most universities uh, gave to their students and it was also free to them which was super strategic yeah. now in hindsight but now as bigger and bigger organizations in the enterprise are adopting g suite one of the key selling points is precisely the fact that over the last decade, Gmail, Google Apps has gained something like 80% market share in K through 12 and higher education. Right, right. Such that almost everybody who graduates and enters the information worker uh, domain has maybe never used anything else in their lives. Right. Yes, definitely. And I, I think we're seeing that. You're right. That many corporations are realizing other systems that they put in place are things that actually now students have never used. Many of them, I mean, if you look back, now we've had Gmail in place for over 15 years. There are people out there who have completely grown up with Gmail. And I, I looked at, I, I see that with my own kids. My kids know nothing other than, I mean, granted, maybe I'm a little biased here, but my kids have, <laughs> know nothing other than Gmail, Google Docs, Chromebooks, et cetera. And that's what they're learning in their schools. And so that was a very strategic thing uh, for us. The other thing that I think was really interesting is, and we saw this with Chromebooks too, is that the education industry and and schools became a really interesting proof point plus you know one of the the the, the markets that was willing to move quickly on right. this That's partially right. for what you you were saying which is it saved them a ton of money to to start off with but they were also getting pressed by their students uh mm -hmm. that they their students wanted better tools to do great things and so for example you know some of our first big customers were Arizona State University and Northwestern University um they rolled that. that was us Oh yes, that's right. That's right. I remember that. We worked. We worked with you guys on that. And um, what it did for us was it built not only built a customer base, but it also built the muscle of how do you actually deploy this with a large enterprise. So, like Arizona State, you know, as, as you all know, we deployed sixty five thousand students, and yeah. that was done in the course of a week. And so that was a very interesting lesson for us on um, on how to make this work. One of the things we learned out of this, which is kind of where our relationship with you had come from, is we needed partners out there to help us. And in particular, we needed partners that were more forward thinking. 
uh, that could that actually realized that the world was going to a very different architecture, yeah. and the partnership model of how to do systems integration was also different. And so that's where our relationship came in, and we had we had a few others that were our go tos that understood that world and were able to implement that new world of what became cloud for many corporations out there. Yeah, that was um, becoming a launch partner for Google Ads for your domain uh, back in 2007, you know, with a product that was, you know, enterprise ready or SMB ready. That was obviously uh, a, map, a fork in the road for us. And to your point, like we were so, you know, relatively small as an organization. It's not like we had sort of preconceived notions and sacred cows around like, oh, actually, this on-premise world is way too lucrative for us. Like, we don't want to take this bet. Um, it was partly due to that, but partly is when we saw it, it, it mirrored pretty exactly in terms of where I thought things were going from our managed services experience. Like, it was really hard to scale stuff on-premise, right? Like, how do you deliver an experience through the browser, in an, you know, with an internet connection anywhere in the world where all this uh, concerns around security, availability, scale, uh, were centralized, made it possible for 65,000 students to go live or, you know, over a week or that's right. Kind of which we ended up doing, I think the muscle building also happened on, on, in the beh on the behalf of your partner ecosystem who learned to um, not only de deploy the kind of te technical work streams to make those things happen with mm -hmm. data migration, identity, security, and other things right. very quickly after the uh, adoption change management uh, impact that's that, right you know the, the number one use application by 100 percent of the employees in the organization like switching that is um we learned a lot way before anybody else about what that means it's true and that that was very hard that i think what we realized is it isn't enough to have just really good technology that the two other aspects of this of how does that really good technology integrate with the way that the enterprise does what they what they do and their systems and then how does it integrate with the people the change management uh, around the employees and you know one of my my the the biggest lessons i've learned in my career was when we first deployed genentech um, genentech was our first large enterprise customer and it was so important to us back in that day that all of us, the entire team went to Genentech's campus on the day that we went live mm -hmm. on that. And we all walked around the various areas within Genentech and saw, you know, from everyday employees what they were going through with that change. And, you know, we learned a lot from it. We learned that things were that were intuitive to us weren't intuitive to people that were just getting started with this. And yeah. even for where it was intuitive, just change is very hard in the enterprise. And I think that's the muscle we've really built up together over the course of those 15 years is how to actually make this change happen. We still do that. We still send in teams on go live day, yeah. you know, that playbook, it still works because Absolutely. change and um, it only happens every 15 years. If it happens at all, right. That they would change on the platform. In fact, uh, the competitive plat platforms used to sell on the premise that, Hey, upgrade with us. Nothing changes. Yes, that's right. But it's precisely the fact that things do change. There lies the opportunity yes. to transform the way people work. This cultural yeah. collaborative paradigm, which our students uh, and, and even, you know, at K through 12 and then higher ed, they know nothing other than uh, real time collaboration as a standard modality of working together in groups. Right. I mean, that's right. It's. Um, the fact that it causes a change is exactly the opportunity. That's why we internally categorize that whole work stream, that whole set of, of products and solutions we go to market with our G Suite, Cloud Search, Chrome as this is our people transformation practice. Right. That's kind of how we right. think of it, you know? Yeah, that, it's a very good way to think of it. And, uh, and, you know, those that do it and come out to the other side end up being much more productive. Here's the other thing that happened, and, and I'm glad you brought up Genetic because this is one of my favorite stories I like to tell about the history of um, G Suite, but also the yeah. impact that G Suite has is uh, Genetic was maybe, I don't know, a few thousand employees. And then when they were acquired by Roche, mm -hmm. with 90,000 employees, they came from on-premise, exchange, office world, 
usually when that happens, and usually it's still kind of more common to happen in these, uh, this other way, which is whatever platforms a large organization has that's doing the acquiring, the smaller yeah. one adopts. That's right. But something remarkable happened. Yeah. In this case, which was actually, it was Roche. That's right. Together. Yeah. Which was amazing oh, wow. for us to see. You know, I thought I, when, when they did get acquired, we looked at that and we thought, oh no, this is, you know, this, the, the, there, there's no way this is going to actually happen. But I think what ended up happening was Roche looked at it and they realized, wow, you know, they're able to be a lot more productive and a lot more collaborative as a result of that. Um, and they also saw, and I think this is another key thing, they saw the IT team that Genentech had as forward thinkers. And that IT team ended up gaining a lot of influence within broader Roche. Yeah. Um, I think that was another interesting thing that I saw here is that, and, and th this is the model really for any early enterprise product. I saw this at VMware. I saw this with Google Apps. I saw this with Chrome. I'm seeing it with AI now, mm -hmm. which is we build heroes within enterprises. That's right. And basically our goal is to make people's career. Uh, with this. I remember it, I learned this early in my career at VM, VMware, where because of VMware's technology, people that were lower down in IT brought innovation into their companies and actually rose up the chain and became influencers within yeah. their company. Google Apps was very similar. The people that bet on us early, we bet on them and 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 they became influencers, influencers within the industry as well. We saw that with Chrome and education in particular, and I'm also seeing the same thing with AI uh, right now. And I think that was an important part is that, and it was also an important responsibility because we were realizing that people were betting their careers on us. And, you know, it, it, it was definitely awe-inspiring to see what people were able to do. That's precisely what I say. That's why I was like, oh my gosh, because it's exactly how I refer to the people and the organizations that are betting their personal careers and futures, but also in a lot of ways, the future of the organization. So the larger that they are, right? The more meaningful right. that decision is, which makes us super proud to be in this business because you cannot go Google and stay the same. You cannot. That's right. yeah. You have to change as an organization, whether you're adopting G Suite or Google Cloud, something about uh, or several things about how you function and how you go to market are going to change. That's the beauty of it. We love customers who take that risk with us, who see the vision of, of what we see. But on the flip side, again, we've only seen this go bad a couple of times very early when we didn't really know how to help customers navigate internally the politics and kind of align with the executive team. Like we learned a lot in the last you know, 12, 12 years. And if, if it's done correctly, it, it sets these people on a completely new career trajectory, promoted, moved to other organizations, but we take that responsibility really seriously. Yeah, yeah. We cannot let them fail. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I, and, and we do the same as well. And um, it's something I think we're adding even more into uh, now to get them to be successful. Because I mean, that is the way. Nobody in enterprise wants to be the first to jump in the pool. And every now and then you find that brave person. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's a person who's willing to take that jump. Um, and and uh, that's how things succeed if you make that person successful. So once you set G Suite onto a certain trajectory, you moved on to Android and Chrome. That's right. For yeah. enterprise and education. Can you talk about the progress you saw in the period of time you were doing that and also yeah. maybe why you took that on as your next challenge? Definitely. And so I took that on in at the end of 2010. And uh, what I was seeing at the time was um, we'd gone through the journey we, we had gone through with G Suite and then that was continuing. But then this new challenge was emerging that, that I thought you know was an, potentially an even bigger challenge. And, and to be honest, it was one of the hardest um, decisions, but also one of the hardest challenges I've taken on, uh, which is, you know, Google had Android at that time, but we were also building this new desktop operating system with Chrome uh, OS. Um, and so I took on the role to um, build out the enterprise business for Chrome 
uh, Chrome OS, Chrome browser, um, and, uh, and and figure out where in the market that would fit. It was very, very early. The day that I joined was when we released our first prototype Chromebook, which was uh, the CR48. Yeah, 48. Yes. Yeah, remember. The, the, the yeah. nice, uh, uh, you know, first uh, Chromebook that we built ourselves. Matte black. It was gorgeous. Exactly. Matte black. It was, it was a very nice looking device at the time. Um, which we, you know, we handed out for free in, in large quantities to, to, to try to seed the ecosystem out there. And it was a much bigger challenge because it was not only, not only were we trying to do the same thing again, which is find those, those first places where this would take shape, but we also had to convince a much broader ecosystem about this, which is Chrome OS by itself wasn't a product it needed the OEM ecosystem, the, the hardware providers and things like that to make it a product. And so we not only needed the customers to jump in, but we needed the OEMs to jump in uh, with us uh, as well, which was, which was definitely harder. What was interesting is very similar to, to Google Apps and G Suite, we saw a very similar pattern. Um, education is where this hit mm -hmm. first. And it yeah. hit in a really, really big way. We were there in the right place at the right time with the right, exact right product. And what we found was that a few of the, the characteristics of Chromebooks were things that nobody else in the industry could do, that they were not only inexpensive, but they were easy to manage. They were easy to kind of cater the experience for, for a student to make sure that, that it, it, was, uh, it was being used in the optimal way within the classroom. Mm -hmm. And what was also happening is that the U.S. was actually moving more towards online testing. So every school had to have a set of computers to do online testing. That's what we used to get the devices into the schools. But what we had was that teachers there realized there's a lot that they could do with the device and actually turn the way that they taught into a whole different way and really espouse the idea of individualized education within, uh, within the classroom. And so it was hard at the beginning. You know, we, we, in fact, you know, almost considered canceling the program within the first year. Really? Because we were, oh we were seeing, you know, reasonable growth, but not great growth um, at, that, at that point in time. Sundar was actually my direct boss at the time. Yes. And then yeah. he made the decision that, yeah, we're going to keep going with it and we're going to see what happens. And a year later, sales increased by 10x between 2012 and 2013. Wow. And we saw that impact happen. And, and it was exactly what we talked about with Google Apps, but in a very kind of closed ecosystem of schools where people talk to each other a lot. So mm -hmm. we got the first few districts to really commit to it. And they went big with it. The impact was seen by many others, and then many other districts jumped in. And I think what's happened since that those early days is that this has become a big hit in enterprise as well. Now, education, we now have more than 60% of the market. Actually, more than 60% of students in the U.S. are using a Chromebook on, uh, on a um, continual basis in their schools. But then... We've now seen this grow within enterprises because of the same thing, because that shareability and security um, and also the, the relative low cost uh, and manageability makes it so that you can bring computing to many more employees than was possible uh, yeah. before. I love, I love how pixel books have pushed a premium angle. Like, I don't know if 2010 you could have imagined, and maybe you did, the announcement Dell made last week. <laughs> of the latitude line yeah built for enterprise super high end if you wanted to with a persistent lte data connection super tricked out hardware performance like two thousand dollar premium chrome devices with the power of you know dell and its logistics network and all the other things they're able to do with virtualization etc for the enterprise yep. like that announcement even took me by surprise. I was like, holy cow, that Chrome has landed in the enterprise. Like that was a statement yeah, to me. Absolutely. And you know, that was that was a announcement that we'd worked on for years to convince uh, Dell to, to, to go that way. It started with the education success, but then we, we saw that success with enterprise. And to your point, 
there's a realization that it's not just a low end device for a certain set of people, but even the higher end users, the people that are on the cutting edge of technology, that is the best device for them. That's the most secure device for them. And it's great to see that expansion uh, into many more segments. Uh, and so I think, I think for example, that partnership with Dell, again, to, to the point where we have to both convince the customers as well as the OEMs, that's happened now, where you know we have one of the largest OEMs in the world that is, that, that is building great hardware that's actually embracing uh, Chrome OS. And so it's it's interesting to see that, you know, those changes. And one thing I love about Google is that you know, that change, it's been now almost a decade since we started Chrome OS, but we've been able to be patient with it and see it flourish uh, yeah. through that uh, through that time uh, to the point at which it is today. Look, if security is your number one thing as an IT leader, which it should be, regardless should be, yeah. of what you think, it should be number yeah. one. There is not a more secure posture than uh, G Suite to Chrome. And you're you're right that that if you look at that complete stack, that is the most secure way uh, to to go, and and that's a big benefit to enterprises that are thinking about that. Now let's talk about your latest role. And by the way, congrats again on 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 uh, on your on your recent promotion. Well deserved. Very Thank few you, people get to transform three different major areas of technology in one career span. Most <laughs> people only you know they can do one. If they're lucky, you're doing it for the third time uh, in the world of artificial intelligence. And you and I, I like, we haven't spoken about this. I don't, I don't know a lot about what you're doing, so I'm, yeah. I'm super curious. Definitely. And, and you know, I'll tell you a little bit about, about what we're doing. And what's interesting is it reminds me very much of the early days of, uh, of apps. Um, and uh, it's interesting. I've used that analogy many times. In fact, in the meeting I just had before this, we were talking about some of the early apps deployments that we were doing and how it relates to what we're doing with AI. So what's interesting with AI is that we believe that AI is potentially the most disruptive technology to come about um, over the course of the last 50 years, um, which is saying something because, you know, I think it's going to have more of an impact than the internet did, that, than the personal computer did over time. I believe, and I, I, we've, been, we've seen this backed with data, is that over the next 10 years, every enterprise will transform themselves with AI very similar to what we saw in the first 10 years of the internet from 1994 on, uh, on to 2004. What's interesting for us is that we, as, as Google, have, of course, invested in AI very heavily over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And especially over the last nine or 10 years, we've increased that investment massively. Um, we call ourselves an AI-first company, and that's not just a marketing shtick. It's, it's real. Like, you know, if you look at every product group within Google, every product at Google has been transformed by AI in one shape or, or another. And so they're the obvious examples where, you know, you can have things like Google Photos, where the whole thing is powered by very, very sophisticated um, image recognition models. Yeah. Um, you have other things like the battery on Android is optimized uh, via AI uh, and things like reinforcement learning. Um, in Chrome, when you draw on the screen on one of the new Chromebooks, we optimize the speed of that, that drawing via AI. Things like that that are that are more subtle but make a big difference for for users. Our goal with cloud is to how figure out how do we bring all of that know how that we have about AI to enterprise customers to help them transform. And so part of it is technology, which is we have a great platform for yeah. AI with our tensor processing units, our software platform on top of that to be able to efficiently build, run, and deploy machine learning models. But that's not enough because what I'm discovering is that similar to cloud in the early days, 70 plus percent of the customers that we talk to, they know what AI is or they know about AI. They don't know why it, it should matter for them. Yeah. Yeah. And so what our goal has been over the last two years is to uplift that message to things where we can solve very specific business problems with our customers 
um, where we can show them the tangible benefit uh, of this and get them along that transformation um, uh, journey. And so we've built a set of what we call building blocks where we're taking the best of Google's AI and making that available as services. And now we're building a set of solutions uh, on top of that that solve specific business problems. And the best example of this is Contact Center. So we have a product called Contact Center AI, which we've integrated with all the major contact center uh, providers out there, people like Genesis, Cisco, Avaya. And we uplift their products so that we can answer questions, easy questions automatically, but then also educate the agent when the agent takes the phone call and give them suggestions. So there you can show a very tangible business benefit with this. Yeah. I mean, you covered um, this great tradition, first and foremost, of how Google takes products to market to the enterprise, mm -hmm. which is Google is in a unique position to do. Kubernetes was an existential necessity for Google. You couldn't do the kind of things you needed to do, launch the kind of products, support the number of users without that framework, for instance, right? Right. Uh, and AI similarly comes out of this intrinsic internal need to add a certain set of capabilities to the seven, eight products that are used by a billion plus people every month. And so, Again, versus anyone else, I think Google's very unique from that standpoint of creating the uh, the thought leadership, open source uh, contribution in the community, the white papers of these very transformational things that now through Google Cloud, taking it to the enterprise, slicing it up, applying SKUs and consumption models and business uh, frameworks to it. That's a unique advantage to me that I think is starting to be understood. Mm -hmm. by by the market uh but it's has been apparent to me forever i mean google was the first consumer of google apps and g suite as well right? that's right about yeah. year, or search and how that became an enterprise thing the process of democratizing these capabilities and putting it into the hands of leaders and also the builders that can apply ai in a um practical manner at scale is the biggest challenge in my view Definitely. And, and, you know, a few stats that we're seeing out there is there are probably only a few tens of thousands of people in the world that can successfully build a deep learning model right now. Right. Um, there are probably on the order of about 3 million data scientists out there. Um, we at Google, one of our teams within my org is Kaggle. Uh, and so Kaggle is the company we acquired that's the largest community of data scientists in the world. And we have about 3 million data scientists there. Um, there are about 23 million developers out there. Yeah. And so AI isn't useful unless those 23 million developers can take advantage of it and build it into what they're doing. The thing we've discovered over the last year, though, is that democratization is not enough. Um, it's more than about democratization. It's also showing people how they can transform themselves and what business impact it can have, which is where these solutions really come from. We need to empower people to transform themselves. The democratization answers the how, but then the why remains unanswered. And so that's where we're going. You know, it's interesting that we were talking about the, the model with Genentech and others. We're following a very similar model here, which is AI, which is, I think, different from a lot of what we have in Google, uh, Google Cloud. It's not just an infrastructure thing. It actually impacts all the way to the end user. And you have to think about about changing business workflows. You have to think about the change management of the people involved. In that, it actually goes way higher in the stack and impacts the end user. Um, so what we're now doing is working closely with a few big enterprises to figure out how we can do that entire change with them and the impact that, uh, that they have. Again, it's all about building heroes. How do we build the first six or seven heroes that transform to their organizations on AI? And I think that what we'll see over the next 10 years is similar to what we saw with cloud between 2005 to 2015, where everybody will implement it, but that impact will be 10 times the, the size because those those that why will become more and more clear. Jack Ma and Elon Musk had an interesting debate last week in Shanghai. I don't know if you yeah. watched it around the future of AI. Yeah. And, and I think it's TBD. Um, and I don't think um, 
you know, organizations will benefit equally, right, mm-hmm. from transformation um, that is inevitable, just like Claude was. It's going to happen. Yeah. You're either going to be um, a proponent of it and lead, or you may be left behind by virtue of what's happening. And one thing I know for sure, and again, the best thing, one of the best things about being in the Google Cloud ecosystem, that every one of our customers who goes on this journey wants to transform deliberately. As we talk to more customers, go to conferences with different verticals, whether it's healthcare or retail, what's abundantly clear is that it is not optional, that they must transform. Mm-hmm. And that because of democratization, any startup with all this funding that's in the sidelines, ready to be deployed, you know, the next generation of disruptors, they'll continue to come. Yeah. And I feel like a great deal of responsibility to the enterprise to help make sure that we, we collectively with Google have to have the vision and the appetite to help them transform yeah. and use the advantages the 50 years, 100 years of being in that business. They don't, they don't just get disrupted by someone else. That's right. And they're no longer relevant. And actually, an interesting thing you pointed out, so that, that, that debate with, uh, with uh, Jack Ma and Elon Musk, there's a lot of fear about AI. And, uh, and that's, I, I think it's, it's understandable. And I think there, there, there are two things we've realized on that. One is that we need to take that concept and turn it into practical reality. Yeah. The second thing, too, is around the responsibility around that um, because we're at this very nascent stage where AI can be a lot used for a lot of good things and and, and a lot of things that aren't that uh, aren't that good uh, that'll affect end customers and their customers uh, quite a bit and so one thing that we've been putting in place is uh, frameworks around AI governance and so we've built for example a set of AI principles for Google itself but one thing that was interesting that I didn't I didn't expect when we released the AI principles is that Every company started, every one of our customers started coming to us and, and saying, you know, how did you do that? We want to try to figure out that for our enterprise. And so we've now been working with a lot of companies on AI governance. Um, and it's 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 something that I think is an important thing to think about as people start to implement AI and can you know implement it in the best way for their organization too. It's arguably the most important thing. But 100x, you know, just like if someone made the journey into cloud without governance, yeah, you had major setbacks, absolutely setbacks, cost controlled setbacks, and actually for them, and certainly in certain parts of the industry, given a moment in time, that there were like a throttling of the exuberance and the energy because of these things started to happen. Look, we've seen with what's going on with tech companies and regulation talk and all this stuff. Like, I really think, again, the onus is on us in the enterprise and on, on companies like Google to lead Absolutely. In, in the area of you know, ethics and um, guidelines, governance principles. No offense, but I don't think like our government's going to do a good job of that, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> they don't even understand... The, you know, the, the, the laws defining cloud and other like simplistic things that are now a given. Um, but unless companies like Google take the charge and do it well, I don't think we'll be able to benefit the market in a positive way like we want to. Absolutely. And I, I think you, you, you pointed out really well that there, there's a potential for that backlash there. And, and you see that already. But if done in a really good way, and if, if done thoughtfully from the beginning, we can orient AI towards things that can be things that can be tremendously beneficial um, at the at the end of the day, and um, and that's the that's I think is is going to be a bigger part of the journey here than it, even it was with cloud. Yeah, and and I think you guys played a fantastic role. That and look, I, I watched that debate, and there's a lot of things I respect about both both men on that stage. Um, mm-hmm. Big Tesla fan and all of that. But you know, I I want to be I want to be in the world of like Jack Ma's uh, optimism, yeah. <laughs> rather than the pessimism. And I think we all have a role to play in that, including us in your ecosystem to align with your principles, Absolutely. to deliver that to uh, you know end users and decision makers. And I'm really looking forward to that next you know five to ten year journey, uh, continuing to work with you in Google Cloud. And thank you so much for all the work you've done in the ecosystem for Google Cloud itself, for us as partners. And um, we hope to work with you many years to come. 
For sure. And I think that uh, likewise, the ecosystem has been important from day one, as, as you know, engaging with us in 2005. But then it's become more and more and more and more and more important as we've gone gone through this journey, because the possibilities of what you can now do with Google Cloud have become much bigger than even where we started in the, at the beginning. And the only way to really deliver that in a way that makes sense to customers is through a vibrant ecosystem with partners like you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great. Thank you, Tony. And, uh, and uh, thanks for taking the time. Thank you for listening to Cloud and Clear. Check the show notes for links to this week's topics. And don't forget to connect with us on Twitter at Cloud and Clear and our website, sada.com. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app.